chronic disease is something that's man-made and we can undo it, but we have to focus and we have to be committed to it. And a lot of the things we have to do to heal are things that our soul needs, like sleep Mm -hmm. and and working through stress, nourishing ourselves properly. And and people need to commit to that process. But I find my hardest job is is getting people to act on the information. Life is short and potentially very short. Mm -hmm. And what did I want my life to be? And very quickly knew that I didn't want it to be about lupus. I couldn't choose how my body felt on any given day, but I could choose what I focused on and what I obsessed about. So I obsessed about my future and all the things that I was going to do instead of the fear that maybe I wouldn't make it. I never believed I wouldn't make it. I am Lisa Roars, former executive coach turned podcaster and digital course creator. Just a few years ago, my typically unwavering optimism was put to the test when my autoimmune system went sideways and handcuffed my dreams to positively impact the world. Fast forward though, through years of failed experiments, dozens of doctors and countless hours of research, and I am now a healthy, thriving CEO of a business that is positively impacting the world by empowering people to exchange fear for fortitude and dis-ease for durability. I created the Sunshine Cafe podcast to give you strategies to be your best self-advocate so you can focus on the things which light you up. If you're looking for hope and encouragement to live a life you love, then you're in the right place. Let's dive in. Hello and welcome back, friends, to the Sunshine Cafe. You are in for a treat, and man, are you going to be glad that you tuned in to today's episode. <laughs> Today, Dr. Brooke Goldner is joining us to share her story. In the wake of her hypernourishing protocol and goodbyelupus.com success, Dr. Goldner leaves a trail of over 4,000 individuals who have healed under her guidance, while countless others have benefited from her protocol, which she freely shares to extend healing to as many people as she possibly can. She sincerely wants you to be able to live your life, and she has the credentials to back it up. Dr. Goldner is a board-certified medical doctor and the author of three best-selling books, Goodbye Lupus, Goodbye Autoimmune Disease, and Green Smoothie Recipes to Kickstart Your Health and Healing. She's been featured in multiple documentaries on TV, on the Home and Family Show, as well as many radio shows, and she's a highly sought-after keynote speaker. She's been featured on the front of Vegan Health and Fitness Magazine not once, but three times, including on the cover of Fit Over 40. She was featured on the Journal of Disease Reversal, Reversing Lupus and Herself, as well as publishing multiple case studies in reversing end-stage lupus nephritis, which is kidney failure, with her hypernourishing nutrition protocol for autoimmune disease reversal. And if that wasn't enough, Dr. Goldner is a graduate of Carnegie Mellon University with honors for genetic research in leukemia and neurobiology. She was a graduate of the Temple University School of Medicine, was chief resident of the UCLA Harbor Residency, and is the sole autoimmune professor for the plant-based nutrition certification from Cornell University. She's a member of the Forbes Health Advisory Board, the founder of goodbylupus.com, and oh, the creator of the hypernourishing protocol. That's a lot. Now, before I dive in, a quick little bit of housekeeping here. As a disclaimer, you must know that the content provided in our podcast is for informational use only. You shouldn't interpret any of this as medical advice. The information discussed here are based on the experiences and the expertise of our guest, but individual health conditions are really different and vary from person to person. So it's important that you consult with a qualified healthcare professional before making any changes to your diet, your lifestyle, or your treatment plan, especially if you are treating a current diagnosis or taking medications. The hosts, guests, and producers of the podcast do not assume any responsibility for the outcomes resulting from the use of the information provided. Listeners are advised to use their own sound judgment and their own discretion while applying any suggestions or recommendations. Now let's dive in. Dr. Goldner, thank you for being with us and welcome to the program. It's my pleasure. Thank you. So I know a lot about you and you have so much information out there. You've been a speaker and you have across the globe have affected lives left and right. But let's just pretend there's some people on our show who haven't heard about the amazing things you have done. Could you tell them a little bit about how you got to where you are and maybe a background of your story? 
All right. So before I was an author or a speaker or even a doctor, I was a patient. And I was diagnosed with an autoimmune disease back when I was 16 years old. I was sick before then, but it was kind of, I had migraines and then I had aches and pains and then I had some rashes and nobody really put it all together. But at 16 years old, finally, I was diagnosed with a disease called lupus. And so lupus is an autoimmune disease that can really impact any organ of the body. And back when I was 16, I was considered young for it, although I've helped people as young as two reverse autoimmune disease now. But back then, I was still young. That was 30 years ago. And uh, not only did they think the lupus was causing the rashes and the arthritis and even the migraines, but they also discovered that I had kidney failure. So uh, that was a really uh, <laughs> it's a difficult time. I mean, being 16 years old and thinking you have some complexion issues and some achy joints to being told that I had not only organ failure, but at the time the nephrologist told me that if they didn't do some aggressive and experimental treatments, I probably had six months before a complete kidney failure and I would be lucky to survive. So that was not a hard sell in terms of medicines. Like she might be dead in six months or you can try this experimental treatment because back 30 years ago, we didn't even have all the medicines they have now, the Plaquenil and Celsept and all the other things. Although there's a lot of people where they still fail those medicines. Even Selena Gomez obviously financially has access to all the medicines and fancy doctors still needed a kidney transplant, right? Yeah. So right. it's a very aggressive and scary disease. Mm -hmm. And they started me on super high doses of steroids every day and seven different other medicines. Some of the medicines were for the lupus and other medicines were to stop me from getting sick from the other medicines. So the experimental treatment they put me on was cytoxan chemotherapy. And the purpose of that was at the time they saw that chemotherapy being used for cancer. One of the side effects is it shuts down people's immune systems. And mm -hmm. it's why before COVID, when you saw someone with a mask on, usually it meant that they were on chemotherapy. They had low immune systems and they were wearing a mask because a flu could kill them. A, right. a, a regular cold could kill them. Sure. So I remember the scariest consult calls I had when I was a medical student was somebody from the cancer ward with a fever. It was just because you knew they had no immune system. Oh my, right? So mm -hmm. they thought, well, since lupus is an autoimmune disease where your own immune system is attacking your, your kidney, what if we intentionally shut off the immune system to save the kidney? Mm -hmm. And so that was the theory. And it's effective, not in everyone. Like I said, Selena Gomez had chemo. She didn't, it didn't help, but I was the one they tested it on. <laughs> and at the time they didn't know how much to use or how often. So usually nowadays it's a targeted approach, a few sessions over a short period of time, I had it for two years straight. Wow. Because every time they tried to stop it, I, I would improve and my kidney function would get better. The lupus looked better. And then they would try to skip a session and then I would start going downhill again. And so they kept restarting it and restarting it. In the meantime, though, my immune system was shot. I mean, I was constant colds and flus. I had a pimple that turned into a wound this big because I couldn't heal like a pimple uh, on my hip. It was very, very difficult. And constantly feeling sick and queasy from chemo is no fun either. Right. It was a very, very hard time, but I'm lucky enough that it did work. It took two years, but finally a, a week before I graduated, a, a week before I went to college, actually, they finally announced me in remission and I was able to stop the chemo and just continue on with the oral medicines. Mm -hmm. So it was a, it was a tough, tough time. And I learned a lot about myself and about it changed you know, really my outlook on, on life. I think most people in their teens are thinking about who's cute and, <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> very kind of super carefree <laughs> going on. Yeah. Uh, but for me, you know, it, it put this knowledge into my head that life is short yeah. and potentially very short. Mm -hmm. And what did I want my life to be? And very quickly knew that I didn't want it to be about lupus. And thankfully my family was very supportive in that. And, and it wasn't, you know, we kind of put it all in the box where I did what I had to do. I, I came from an immigrant family that where we, you know, like you listen to your doctors. Mm -hmm. That's what we did back then. We didn't mm -hmm. have Google. So you had no choice. The right. Were the expert. Yep. They had <laughs> all the information. Right. Yeah. And um, and so it was like, do what the doctors say. So I took every pill. I went to every treatment. And then I put that in a box like that's done for the day. So I would take all seven pills in one swallow. So I wouldn't have to think about how many pills I took because that was depressing. You know, I would just and then I put it away and go, OK, how do I want to spend my day? 
I couldn't choose how my body felt on any given day, but I could choose what I focused on and what I, what I obsessed about. So I obsessed about my future and all the things that I was going to do instead of the fear that maybe I wouldn't make it. I never believed I wouldn't make it. I even started getting super into biology. I took all AP courses in spite of being sick and I still graduated top of my class. You, you know, I would read at chemo. It was a long day sitting there. I would just study whenever I could. And I thought maybe I'll be a geneticist and I'll find a cure for lupus. Mm. And uh, and then I went, I, I actually went to Carnegie Mellon for, I got a scholarship for, it was my top dream school. And I got an academic scholarship. It was very exciting. And it was exciting for me because studying without chemo was actually a lot easier, not feeling constantly in a fog and nauseous. Right. Amazing. But that's why, so I originally went into genetics and and doing genetic research. I graduated with honors because of genetic research I did in leukemia and eye development, neural development, and discovered I don't like doing research. I like people. (laughs) So I decided to go into medical school. And my hope was to do something that I gave up on the idea I'd ever cure lupus. I thought, okay, that's not my path. (laughs) Uh, But (laughs) I thought my experiences could really help. One, I I love science. Two, I love people. And I've always been good at at helping people. And so I thought, well, I'll just go into that profession where I could teach other people how to live good lives in spite of their trauma, in spite of their pain, in spite of their illnesses. If I can do it, they can do it. And that was my goal. And I actually, my goal was to work with the homeless. I was the youngest medical director in, in L.A. County working with young people coming out of homelessness and juvenile justice and foster care. And I thought that was it. That's my, that's going to be my life, but things changed. And so obviously if you're talking to me, things changed, but the short version of the story is I tripped and fell into understanding that there is more to autoimmune disease than just your genetics, but rather that nutrition plays a role. And I found out by accident when I met my husband and guys, this is the short version of my story, okay? Uh, <laughs> my book could buy a little bit of the longer. This is the short version. But basically what happened was I met my, my future husband, who his obsession and his best-selling book is all about metabolism and how there must be one optimal diet for humans. And it frustrated the heck out of him that scientists seem to have forgotten what our species is supposed to eat, where they know what every other species is supposed to eat, but mm-hmm. humans, they argue. And he said, this isn't science. And so he became obsessed with the science of how nutrition impacts cellular function in terms of fat loss and bodybuilding. Mm, Interesting. So he was very well known for that. He was on TV for that. And so I wanted him to train me. He wanted to marry a sick person who could never have his children, Mm. who was going to die young, that he was going to have to take care of when I was chronically ill. Like he signed up for this. But I mean, I gave him an out when we, we fell in love. I mean, it just, it was very quickly. I never believed in soulmates as a scientist until I met him. And then I was like, well, obviously that's real. And Still think so. But uh, yeah, he wanted to marry me, even though it was going to be short and a lot of sickness. And they told me if I had children, it would kill me. And he said, I'd rather have a short life with you than a lifetime with anyone else. I'll just make it the best life you could ever have. Who's going to turn that down? (laughs) Seriously. That's, that is the line that many women dream of ever hearing. (laughs) Right. (laughs) He's made it the best life. I've got to say he's amazing. We've been married. Goodness. Uh, 18 years. Wow. And, uh, and it is, he's, he's right. It's the best life ever, but the, the strange part about it, and it always reminded me, and this is kind of funny because it's totally against health. But when I was a kid, there was this commercial where a guy is running with chocolate and another guy's running with peanut butter. And then they slam into each other. Oh, okay. And the chocolate goes in the peanut butter. And that's how like peanut butter cups were discovered or something. Sure. <laughs> okay. That, that I feel like that's how we discovered how to reverse autoimmune disease. I was running and he was running and we slammed into each other and it was delicious. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I did his protocol to lose weight for my wedding. He had to alter the protocol for me because I was already a vegetarian and I ate tons of eggs and cheese, but I didn't eat meat. He said eggs and cheese are not good for fat loss. In fact, they will make you fatter. But um, not that he ever said I was fat. He made sure I knew this. He said it would make people fatter. Yeah. But he thought meat was still necessary for protein at the time in his research. But I would need it. So I was the first person that ever went on a plant-based version of this. And I was also the first person to recover from incurable disease. So within three months of changing my diet, I had negative labs for the first time since I was 16. And I was 28. So 12 years of chronic illness. And in the meantime, I did get other sick episodes. I mean, I got mini strokes, you know, so while going through medical training, I would get relapses and flares, you know, high stress 
poor sleep. So wow. bad diet, hospital food is a great way to be the sick. Worst. It is yeah. good uh, for yeah. hospital business, you know? So it was just one of those things where, you know, I'd been chronically ill, seriously ill for a dozen years, and then suddenly had no illness at all. So yeah. this is now, um, this year is 18 years that I've been lupus free, uh, 17 years off medicine, because when it first happened, none of us believed I was actually better, even though my labs were negative. So I still took medicines, including injecting myself with blood thinners because, I didn't want to die. I've had two amazing kids. I've never had a relapse in 18 years. So that changed both of our lives because, well, one, we get to grow old together. But then after four years of my health and having my first kid without relapse, we realized that there must have been something to the nutrition. We didn't even, it didn't even cross my mind because I'm a doctor. I wasn't trained in nutrition, so it must not matter. I thought it was just like some miracle. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but uh, I finally started taking it seriously. And then we did the research. And then once we proved it was reproducible, we released it to the public for free. And so that's how I became known. And at this point, people all over the world have done my protocols just off of my free content classes, Q and A's, or they read my books and have been able to reverse their diseases effectively. I mean, I work with people directly too, but my goal is to make as many people able to do it without me as possible. Because, you know, I want you to be able to live your life. And as my husband says, he wants you to have your wife. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Life and the wife. And you know what? That's one of the things that I think really draws people to you, Dr. Goldner, is the fact that you are so approachable and you truly, you've, I think you've said this before many times, that one of your missions is to just help as many people as you can, yeah. um, which is a unique and an awesome goal to have, because I think a lot of people in the medical field get a bad rap for just wanting to just make as much money as they can and then get out. And instead, I don't know anyone like that. Honestly, I um, feel like doctors get a really bad rap in general. Mm -hmm. But when I remember when I went to medical school, uh, then we're talking like 20 years ago, but I remember when I went to medical school, even then my doctors told me, don't bother going into medicine anymore. You can't make money. Okay. So, there, so, and I was like, well, I'm not doing it for money. I mean, you can make a living. Yeah. Yeah. But I still haven't paid off my med school loans. Wow. All right. And yeah. I'm going to be 47. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> um, so it's not a way, it's not a fast track to being rich or anything to go to medical yeah. school. Yeah. You can make a good living. Mm -hmm. Right. And student loans are at least low interest. Mm -hmm. But the reason that you would go into medicine in the past 20 years was because you actually cared and, and wanted to go into medicine. Right. Back before then, the previous generation that's already retired, they basically had an open blank check that they would get paid whatever they charge for, you know, the, uh, their health insurance company, doctor will submit, they get paid. Nowadays? Yeah. yeah. No yeah. way. They don't right. pay anything. And they tell you how much time you have to see a patient. So right. the doctors I know now, they went into it to help people. And then they spend like 10 minutes a person just to be able to see enough patients where they could at least make something that they could have pay their rent or their mortgage. Right. But it's not what it was. So I, I think it's an old rap, but I think it's unfair, honestly. Yep. I'm not a part of that system. I never have. I never believed that. I, I believe, and I used to teach this at the nonprofit, I believe it was heals people's relationships. I don't yeah. think you can know what somebody has and how to help them in 10 minutes. So right. my my sessions are 75 minutes. Like I get right. to know people. Right. And even back when I first started as a at, at the nonprofit, one of the things I liked about it was I could do what was right for to me. Mm -hmm. And I helped patients where, you know, there was one gentleman I'll never forget who had severe anxiety and wouldn't leave his house. Mm -hmm. And he was one of the luckiest ones to be homed, but he couldn't leave his house. And so rather than having him dragged to see me once a month for 10 minutes and prescribing medicines, I would go and see him and sit with him in his room while he played video games. Mm -hmm. And then one day when he trusted me enough, I took him to Subway and it was his first time ever ordering something. And I stood by his side and kept him come and I helped him wow. order his first food. And then wow. I got him to the beach. And then I finally got him to come with me to the clinic. And by the end of that year, his brother was a truck driver and he went on a cross country trip with his, with his brother and got to see the whole country. Wow. So to me, I wanted to do what works for people mm -hmm. and what works for helping people recover is really getting to know them, creating trust, creating real relationships. Yeah. So I've always been out of that system. I've always stubbornly refused right. that I'm not going to help someone in 10 minutes. I just won't do it. I want to really connect with people and truly help them. Yeah. So it's, but that is a rare thing that I've been able to navigate that for myself. And then I created my private practice where obviously I can do what I want, yeah. um, but it is, it is difficult. Most doctors, I know there's very high rates of depression, anxiety, suicidality. Yeah. 
because they feel like they're not helping people. They mm -hmm. went through all this schooling and all this money to save lives and nobody yep. gets better. Right. Well, and on top of that, like you said, they're forced into this system where they only have this short little bit window to get to know right. what the patient and the patient has to in 10 minutes, maybe 15 spit out exactly what's happening in the key events that are working in their oh, life. This is what they do. Working. They check your labs yeah. and they're like, uh, maybe it's this, here's a pill. Let's see right. you in two months, see what happens. And, and so like, that's yeah. why it takes years sometimes for people to get diagnosed because they can't even get their story out. The doctor doesn't have time. They're doing their best. Whereas I solve problems all the time in one visit. Cause yeah. I just, I always ask people, tell me your story. And I sit back and I listen. Yeah. I just listen to the whole story. Tell me from your childhood till today what your health has been. And for most people, it's the first time I've had people cry just from that. It was the first time anyone just listened. Mm -hmm. And usually I can figure it out be like, this isn't a new thing. This is the childhood constipation, which led to that eczema. Okay. Now that led into having these uh, thyroid condition, right? These are all connected conditions. You've mm -hmm. had this thyroid condition that's autoimmune. And that's led now into this chronic arthritis that you're having, which is not some new thing, but a result of untreated autoimmune disease. Like your body tells a story. Yeah, it's all connected. Said, Listen. Yeah, all connected from the very beginning. Yeah, we don't just immediately get sick. Um, it's not a light switch. Yeah, we yeah. slowly dig that hole. And um, I love how your protocol is so good about teaching us how to undig that hole and to slowly move to the other side. How to climb out, right? I'm climb on the out. outside like, hey guys, up here, you know? <laughs> and that's why I do my free Q and A's every week and everything. I'm like, hey, over here, over here, come up here. But right. yeah, it's difficult. And and I would say it's not a light switch, it's like a storm, right? You have the, the temperature and you have the winds and you have the elevation and there's so many different, the humidity, right? A storm doesn't happen out of nowhere. There's multiple factors that come together to create it. Same mm -hmm. thing with illness. You have your genetics, yes, but something has to trigger that, right? And so that's when you get nutrition and stress, trauma, sleep. You know, there's so many things that infections, there's so many different things that come together to finally create a storm that we would call disease. Right. And you can reverse it. If you weren't born with it, you can reverse it. But we have to address all these different areas. And we often have to be more aggressive mm -hmm. to get rid of that storm and to calm it down than you ever would have had to be to prevent it. That's why our protocol is called hypernourishment. It's a nutrition overdose. In right. the nutrition, I know optimizes cellular repair and immune function. But by the time you're sick, you need an overdose. You've been starved for these things for decades. You know, we can make a, a rapid change in how you feel with that overdose state, especially if you combine the stuff that's in my second book and by autoimmune disease, which is all about the mental stuff, right? The depression and the trauma and the stress and all that stuff. But, yeah. but you know, that book I wrote because if you couldn't read Goodbye Lupus and just do it, right? That was all about my story and the nutrition, then there's other stuff going on and we have to address it, right? So I'm always trying to fill in the gaps for people and give them the next thing that they feel like they're missing. Because again, my goal is that you can be free of this. That chronic disease is something that's man-made and we can undo it, but we have to focus and we have to be committed to it. And, and a lot of the things we have to do to heal are things that our soul needs, like sleep, Mm -hmm. and, and working through stress, nourishing ourselves properly. Yeah. And, and people need to commit to that process. But I find my hardest job is, is getting people to act on the information. Exactly. Uh, I, I was so just going to ask you about that because it's the first step is really that mental shift, that mental focus and really getting ourselves to do that. I want to kind of back up a little bit because when you were young and they gave you that diagnosis, and I've heard some of the things that the doctors had told you about what you were and were not going to be able to do when in life and how much life you were and we're not going to have. Do you have any sense for maybe our listeners? What, what was it that kept that spark going and gave you the mental focus to be able to just kept pressing on for whatever days you had on this world? Ah, goodness. I think there's multiple parts. I mean, some of them is, is, is who I am. Uh, I think we're, there's a part of our personality that we're starting with, but more of it, I think, was how I was raised. Okay. So I, I had the luxury of being raised in safety. My family was refugees from World War II. My grandparents are Holocaust survivors. My mom was born in Poland after the war. Mm -hmm. So the fact that I got to be born free and safe with family that was kind, and uh, I never felt threatened in my own home. Um, it, was a, it was actually a quiet, peaceful home. I actually have zero memories of my father ever yelling. Mm. Most nice. people are shocked by that. You know, like they just think all dads yell. No, my dad talked to me about things. 
Nice. <laughs> we discussed things. Yeah. So I got to grow up in a place where I felt safe. And so I didn't have that kind of trauma that made me a lot of times when people don't grow up feeling safe, um, they're always on the lookout for things going wrong. And yeah. so even a, a diagnosis is proof that life is bad and bad things were coming. But yeah. when you get to grow up safe, then you can have a belief that things will work out. When I work with my patients, and I help people reverse anxiety disorders. I always help them with that. A lot of them, they became anxious as children. And I always tell them the most important pivotal milestone of childhood is safety. My kids are able to develop in, a, in an optimal way because they're not scared of anything. Their, their home is safe. Their parents are safe. You know, mm. they've never been hit. There's nothing bad that's going to happen there. We don't talk about things that are scary. You don't yeah. talk to your kids about money situations or, you know, like we, you, and that's, and if that's the case, they can fantasize and dream and believe. Right. Yeah. So I, I had the incredible gift of having that. And I, and I really believe it's one of the reasons why I'm really good at helping people heal from anxiety and trauma. A lot of times the folks that are the therapist for people with trauma are people who they themselves have experienced it and they're still working through it. But I actually have the opposite. I grew up in a family of trauma resilience where my grandparents who were survivors did not have PTSD. They were happy people who used to tell me how lucky they were all the time. Mm. Most people who survived World War II uh, and, and were prisoners would not say that they were lucky, but my grandparents actually felt it. My grandmother believed it with all her heart. So That's I was gratitude. raised with that, that, that you can be in the moment. And my grandmother didn't live in her trauma. She lived in the moment where she had she had a, a house in Florida and she had kids and grandkids and she was lucky. And so yeah. I learned from my family too, that you can't control external events. You can't control what may happen. But if you can be in the moment and you can have hope and gratitude, then you can have a good life. So for me, you know, I still felt very lucky because I grew up with stories of the Holocaust. All of my grandmother's friends had tattoos on their arms. So, I mean, I grew up very aware of what terror could be out there yeah. and very grateful for how safe I was. Yes. And so I felt I was luckier with lupus on chemotherapy than my family members who died in the Holocaust, or even some of them that survived. My grandfather's sister was eight when she was burned, you know, in the gas chamber uh, mm -hmm. when she died in the gas chamber. So it's like, it's hard not to feel lucky is what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> so even yeah. though I had a diagnosis, there was treatment, there was support. I believed that my doctors would help me. And I had the ability to be hopeful and grateful that, you know what, they might be predicting this could happen, but they don't know. And so mm -hmm. I just decided that if I was going to believe a story, I would believe the version where I overcame it all and kept living rather than the version where I died of kidney failure. Yeah. So that's what I did. I chose and I, and I teach people with anxiety this too, that, that anxiety is a made up story. It's a story of what you think could go wrong. So at least balance it with a made up story of what might go right. At least have balance. But yeah. I kind of, I'm off balance, but I'm a, I'm a glass overflowing. I'm always, I always believe the best possible thing will happen. And so far it's working out. You know, mm -hmm. I, I had someone recently tell me, that I was unlucky because I've been through so much. They're like, gosh, you've been through so much. You're so unlucky at 16 kidney failure. You're having many strokes in your twenties. Like you've suffered so much. And I was like, what? I didn't even think about that. I'm always like, I thought of myself as a comeback kid, no matter how sick I ever got. Even when I was sick and I hadn't recovered, I still felt lucky because I was always beating the odds. Every time they're like, oh no, you know, mm -hmm. like it was always scared I was going to die. And then I didn't. And I, I and I and so for me, I was like, I must be the luckiest person ever. There you go. <laughs> so there you go. It's just a choice. So yeah, there's, I think there's a lot of reasons to it, but I, 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 I credit my family the most. Um, my grandmother is my role model that if she could be happy and she could be grateful and she could be lucky then anybody can. And I can too. Yeah. That's absolutely beautiful. I just love that. I love the, the joy. I mean, for those of you who can't see, um, Dr. Golder's <laughs> face right now, she's just glowing. Um, it's like, and I think that's a good, yeah, tool. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's a really good tool for anybody listening. If you're going through something hard to choose a different story, write yourself what your story is going to be. And if you don't have a grandmother who's giving you all that encouragement, take Dr. Goldner as your encouragement and just capture what you want out of life and just go after that instead of letting someone else decide what your story is going to be. Um, there might be inputs, like you said, Dr. Goldner, there might be doctor inputs or other people's inputs, 
but we have to balance them. Those, that's a great reminder, hope and gratitude and keeping yeah. that. People special. tell me all the time that like my grandmother keeps them going. Yeah. Um, in the story <laughs> I, I, I've told before where at the end of the war, they released the prisoners and she was put in a train station to go back to Ludge and she didn't know what was, you know, she was starved and, and skeletal and had been abused and tortured. And at the train station, she heard music and she danced. And when I asked her, how did you dance? She said, well, I hadn't heard music in two years. And when you hear music, you dance. And that was her logic. Like she was in that moment, no longer a prisoner or tortured or depressed. And she wasn't in the future scared, like who survived? Do I have parents? Do I have siblings? She was in the moment with the music. Yeah. Yeah. And so we can all choose to be there. It's not always easy. Sometimes we have to continuously return to it. Right. Yeah. But if yeah. you can use, and that's what I call mindfulness, you know, mindfulness is not just meditation, but it's being fully present in the moment using your, your senses, right? Cause if you use your senses, your five senses are always in the present moment. Mm -hmm. Your brain can go in the future and the past, but your five senses are always in the present. If you use your senses and anchor yourself, you can find peace there and even gratitude. Yeah, absolutely. It's such a good reminder for all of us, no matter where we're coming from or what we're dealing with. So I think a lot of people get concerned when they think about a, a protocol for healing, that they're never going to have pizza again, or they're never going to have the things that they consider right now as their first loves. Let's say someone's dug themselves out of their healing protocol issues, and they're feeling like they've gotten further away from that disease or dis-ease that they were feeling, do they go back ever to animal products? Do they stay totally on plant? Do you have some examples about what a new normal looks like for some of your clients? Yeah, absolutely. So there's multiple levels to this. So one is a massive change in mindset. So you talk about first loves. I don't think we should use the word love to anyone or anything that's trying to kill us or anything that abuses us. So one of the first things I do, and some of you who have had appointments with me, you've heard, I will interrupt someone when they say, I love cheese. I'm like, no, you don't. Uh, that is a codependency and it's abusive. You might think you're in love, but the cheese is killing you. So mm -hmm. do you want to use the L word? Because if we use the word love, we're always going to be magnetized towards it because we all want love. So I always make them in the moment say I'm addicted to because mm -hmm. addiction requires intervention. If you say I'm addicted to cheese, it sounds like we got some work to do. We need an intervention. Right. You say, yeah. I love cheese. Ooh, what are the platter? Right. So right. I don't let someone use the word love. We're addicted to it. I was addicted to cheese. That was my, my favorite thing. I thought that that was like the best part of my day was a big thing of cheese from Costco. Just, you know, <laughs> it was an addiction yep. and yep. it was a way of getting high at the end of the day, but Literally. it was killing me. Right. So, so I think it's important that we should never want to return to it. That's like finally escaping an abusive relationship with someone who abused you emotionally or physically or both. And then you finally escape, you go to therapy, you get yourself healthy, and then you look them up to see if they want to chat or get together. No, yeah. no, <laughs> so yeah, don't go there. <laughs> yeah. So it's really important to separate out love from addiction. And if you find out the truth that something or someone has been harming you, that you put boundaries in place to not allow that into your life again. Mm -hmm. Now, that does not mean that you cannot sometimes have some inflammatory things, Okay. But the worst perpetrator, no, I don't recommend that anyone does that, right? I mean, I know for me, I would rather eat nothing but but lettuce and keep feeling as amazing as I do than ever eat a pizza again. There's just no chance that I would give up the fact that I get to be healthy. Like tonight, my kid has a choir concert. I have two kids who are like amazing. Why would I ever go back to the cheese? The cheese, no, she's like, she's out. Like there's yeah. just no... No bringing it back. So I think it's important that we don't have a love affair or have a longing like, oh, I love cheese, but I'll give it up for now. But one day I'll be back. No. The other way to put it is like a dieter's mentality where it's like, I won't eat that until I lose the weight and then I'm going to gorge on it and gain it all back over a weekend. I used to diet when I was younger. That's how it worked. So, so I do think that it is important to work on that mindset. And that's a lot of the work that I do with folks is helping them create a mindset that will allow them to heal and stay healthy. I had someone who did my rapid recovery group who had lupus in her kidney, her lungs, and her liver. And she was morbidly obese. And in six weeks, she normalized her labs. Wow. And had lost tons of weight and went from laying on the couch to feeling good and out and about with her kids, right? Amazing recovery. In right. Six weeks, my rapid recovery. Life back. It's amazing, right? Yeah. Over the weekend, after the group ended, and I, you believe me, at the end of the group, I go through 
what to do for step down. Step down is going from the most extreme protocol for healing to a more relaxed one, not inflammatory, but not so strict, right? Over the weekend, she ate meat and dairy and texted me on Monday. I always give my clients my cell phone number. So if they have anything going on, they can text me. She texted me on Monday. I can't get off the couch. I feel sick. So what did you do between Friday and Monday? She goes, well, I ate a bunch of meat and dairy. I said, did you have your hands over your ears when I was teaching you what to do? She goes, yes. She goes, I'm being honest with you. I'm a food addict. I always told myself six weeks and I'm done. So I didn't listen to you for the mindset work. I didn't listen to you wow. about step down. I was like six weeks, did it, McDonald's. I said, okay. I said, all right. Now that you know that you're a food addict, you made that choice. What are you going to do now? And, she, and so I said, I call it doing research. You did your research and you proved you feel like garbage, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now what? Today's a new day. Right now is a new moment. And she got back on track and she did it. She, she recommitted and she's continued to be healthy. She's lost over 60 pounds. She's doing amazing. But it was that, like, she had to experience that in order to convince herself. What I said was not, even the fact that her lab showed she had reverse lupus in multiple organs in 42 days wasn't enough to convince her addicted brain, maybe I shouldn't eat that stuff, that right? Sense. But then the reality hit of adding it back and she went, oh, this is real. I have to get out of this, right? Yeah. So for some folks, they need that. I hate that when people have to do that to themselves because I don't want people to get sick. But I have seen that most of the time people go through that process they're ready to go. I mean, on the daily basis in my rapid recovery group, they're watching me multiple times a day to work through that mindset, to work through anxiety and trauma, addictions, all of that. And so most people by the end of it are like, I can be a raw vegan forever. Like, I'm so happy. I feel so good, you know, but it is possible to go blah, 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 and, uh, and just eat and quit. Right. But most of the time, that's what it is that it takes for people to right. be able to finally change their mindset is continuously working on that daily. So if people are doing that on their own. I always tell them that, you know, every time you see unhealthy food, I don't even call it food, unhealthy food or like, yeah. food, like <laughs> drugs, I call it, you know, that, that you tell yourself, no, that's, that is addiction and that is disease. And I don't want that. Right. Rather than, Ooh, that looks so good. I wish I could have what I love. So yeah. I had just had to say that and get that out of the way. Now, yeah. in terms of the longer version of that question, what I have found for myself and for my clients is that if you follow a process where you, so the hyper nourishment protocol is really about what you add in order to get yourself healthy. And I have a lot of resources for that. I have classes online where you can learn all the details of why and all that, but it's about adding what you need to recover. So shorthand would be cruciferous vegetables and dark leafy greens, omega-3 fatty acids from flax and chia, getting enough water intake. These are things you add to optimize the health of your cells, your ability to repair damage and to have your immune system work. For some people, adding that to their current diet is all they need to do. It depends how unhealthy your diet is. For many people, they have to be really hardcore and strict. That's what I call the goodbye lupus protocol, where you only eat the foods that help you heal until you're well. Once you're well, now you can relax a bit. So when people are well, what I recommend to maintain good health is you do a hyper-nourishing plant-based diet that can include raw foods and cooked foods. So that's what I do. You can have smoothies and salads and all the raw foods. And then if you want to have cooked foods, you can have cooked vegetables, different kinds of beans, quinoa, millet, barley, steel cut oats, stuff like that. So, so a fairly diverse plant-based diet. I recommend people stick to high raw. That's what I've seen be best for maintenance and also for energy mm -hmm. resistance to infections, things like that. The nutrients are where it's at. It's why I'm always kind of hyper. I'm very, very nourished all the time. Yes, <laughs> so right. um, and a lot of people so don't realize when you cook those things, that's when the, yeah. the quality of the food degrades while you're cooking it. So that's what Dr. Golden is yeah, talking absolutely. about. You want them raw. So, cause you yeah, get the most absolutely. bang for your buck that way. Yeah. I'm super nourished. I probably don't need to have as much raw food as I do, but I don't like the feeling of cooking. When I have something cooked, it's always at dinner time. Yeah. Because at that point, I don't mind if my energy goes down, I have to sleep, mm -hmm. right? But during the day, like I'm just living off my smoothies and just jamming on that. And it feels really good. So a high raw plant-based diet, that is great for disease prevention. And it's great for health maintenance. Now, when someone's been healthy for six months or more, I usually say, okay, if you've been healthy for six months or more, no relapse, no symptoms, feeling wonderful. You can now tolerate some inflammation. Mm -hmm. So at that point, it's kind of like, if you just had, I remember uh, what I was here for Hurricane Harvey. I'm in Houston now. Right after the storm, the hurricane passed, but it was still raining. And that created more flooding, 
right? So sometimes when you first got better, you still have to be careful that you don't do anything that's going to worsen your symptoms. So you don't want to add any junk facts like that when you add it back to animal products, right? Sure. But after six months or more, people can tolerate some inflammation. So um, I call that recreational eating, like mm-hmm. recreational drugs, you do it to get high. But for my clients who have been healthy for six months or more, I have some people who have been healthy for a decade that they find that they can do a plant-based diet, high raw, and maybe one or two items a week that are inflammatory. I recommend people stay away from the animal products because I've seen that get people sick too often, but it might be like vegan junk food, like a donut or a, um, or, or a glass of wine or a beer or an impossible burger. Those are not healthy things, but a healthy body can tolerate it here and there as long as that's not your main food that you're having all the time. Got it. Got it. Okay. Well, great. Well, there's just so much, so much goodness in there. And I just think, um, just to kind of back up what you were saying about the cheese, when I did your protocol, um, and you and I were meeting, I swore I was never going to give up cheese. Like, I think maybe, you know, I'll have to put it into that occasional because I loved cheese. I was very much, ad- I wasn't in love. I didn't love it. I was addicted to it. Yeah. Yes. Correct my own language here. Anyway, I just want our listeners to know that as another person who was very much addicted to cheese, I do not crave it at all anymore. I think, you know, once you change the gut bacteria, once you change your taste buds and you change your habits, you can and you do get to a point where you actually do start craving things that are good for your body and your body is ready and open to receiving it. So absolutely. In the beginning, cravings are bad. Cravings usually peak by the third week. And so for a lot of people, once they get to week two, they quit because they're like, all I can think about is junk. Yeah. I just can't live this way. But they don't realize if they could stick with it for a month, those cravings really tend to go away. And then you yeah. start craving good things. Right, right. So, yeah. I remember being a kid. I mean, I was born in the 70s, you know, so I remember being a kid in the 80s when they finally started to uh, to, to tell the public that smoking was actually causing cancer that mm-hmm. kind of came out then. My parents were both smokers. And then the secondhand smoke data came out. And they quit. They went to a hypnotist actually, and they quit smoking for me because they didn't realize it could hurt me. Right. And so I remember after they quit, all of their friends smoked and they were constantly talking to them about quitting. And they even dragged some people to the hypnotist with them, but they were constantly saying how bad it smelled and how gross it is. And I always heard their friends say, the worst non-smoker is an ex-smoker. So (laughs) it's one of those things where they went from addicted to disgusted. Yes. And and that time to happens when you're addicted, you can't think of a time when you won't want it. But yes. once you recover, it actually repulses you. Like I can't even imagine ever. I know I could probably get away with having dairy sometimes. I've been healthy so long. There's no chance. It, it disgusts me now, which is mm. wild considering how addicted I was to it back then. Yeah. And for anyone listening, um, go check out Brooke Goldner's um, videos that are online because you will find out why you want to stay away from dairy. And you really might be that's where the classes are. Goodbye lupus.com. Yep, exactly. Really, really good. So, all right. Well, um, I would, I would love to just talk with you for about another three years, but we will wrap this up here somewhat (laughs) soon. A couple quick questions to kind of wrap up. And I want to make sure we save a little time for people to be able to know how to find you. But now that you are 18 years past your diagnosis and you've got this beautiful life with your amazing husband and your two awesome kids. Is there one thing in particular that kind of brings you the most joy these days? The most joy? Goodness, my focus is always on joy. Um, Gosh, I think you really name the things that do. I mean, I I always tell people in order to be motivated, especially through cravings, you have to find your why, your big reason. And I feel like I have so much of that. I mean, every day just being able to wake up next to my husband is incredible. We, we literally can't look each other in the, in the eye for more than a few seconds without tearing up. Cause we're so grateful for each other and we love each other so much. My kids are amazing. I don't know how I got lucky enough to be blessed with these children, but they are absolutely incredible. Way smarter than my husband and I, I don't know what happened. Well, actually <laughs> I've heard that raising kids plant-based and omega threes research have shown optimize a Q IQ, we we overshot. <laughs> they are they're brilliant and they're kind and just yeah. wonderful. So raising them is the biggest blessing. Like even on the hardest day, it's still amazing to me. Like I'm a mom, these beautiful kids. So oh, that gets me I happy know. every day. Yeah. Being able to, to have a job where I not only help people, but I can help give them back their lives so that they can live their dreams right. rather than be stuck with illness and despair. 
I mean, it gets me going every day. Yeah. Um, being able to give service for the people who can't see me and be able to, 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 you know, do my Q and A's and connect with people around the world. I just feel like it's a dream. My whole life is really a dream that I get yeah. to be in this place where everything that I've ever been through, everything that I ever suffered through is now a gift for other people's lives. Yeah. I don't know. I just, I yeah. just wake up happy and grateful every day. It's so true. So true. And it just, yeah, everything that you went through, you're using to help someone else and whatever was intended to be used for evil, you're turning it around and using it for good. So that's beautiful. Okay. One last question. If you were able to go back and talk to that 16 or 20 year old person, what would you say? Do you think? Goodness. I don't know. I'm not a believer in changing anything, right? I don't want to mess anything up. (laughs) Yeah. I don't know. I I feel like even it's, I know it sounds weird, but even at 16 and kidney failure and chemo, I was happy and grateful for my life. Like I just, there were definitely moments where I would play REM, everybody hurts and cry a bit. Like when I was really feeling sick. My mom knew if I was playing that, I had a rough night. But most of the time, but then at the end, when he sings, hold on, I'd be like, oh, I'm here. Yeah, I'm just a fighter. I'm going like, to keep going. Keep, yeah, keep going. It's going to be amazing. All right. Yeah, I, don't know, awesome. I, I feel like I wouldn't change a thing. Okay. Um, so maybe just, just uh, that little. And your husband's going to be super hot. There you and, go. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> Hold so on, it's getting I, only I, better. I feel like every moment of my life has been amazing for its own reason. Whether I was learning how strong I was or or like diving into science and my love for that, you know, every aspect of it. I don't know. I, I feel like there's been all the chapters have had amazing parts to it. So mm-hmm. I don't know that I would say anything. I think I would just leave her alone. Okay. <laughs> well, that's you're doing great. Keep going. There you go. There you go. Well, I tell you what, that beautiful soul of your grandmother's is a living legacy through you with her optimism is glowing now through you and is affecting so many lives. And it's just so fun to see you use that for good. Really, really exciting. Let's tell people where they can find you because I know they're going to want to. Okay. So um, first of all, if you're on any kind of social media, I'm there pretty much every day. So Instagram, Facebook, if you look up Goodbye Lupus, at Goodbye Lupus on Instagram or Goodbye Lupus by Brooke Goldner MD. But if you look Goodbye Lupus, you'll find me on, on Instagram and Facebook, YouTube, same thing. GoodbyeLupus.com is my website. I help people with all different kinds of illnesses, but Goodbye Lupus is my story. So that's mm-hmm. that's GoodbyeLupus.com. I have online classes where I teach my protocols and every once in a while I put them up for free to just kind of encourage people go watch and learn. I do live Q and A's for the public. I do it every Wednesday at 1230 PM Pacific time. And it's just so people from the public can get support, encouragement, answer questions, everything I can do to help people for free. I do because I really want this to be just something that becomes common sense for people and they have access to the information and to me. And of course, if you actually want my help, and you want to, if you're struggling with food addiction or for people who have organ failure, I really recommend they work with me directly. People with kidney failure, heart failure often can't do the nutrition the way I just teach it generally because it could cause really massive issues, electrolyte imbalances, all sorts of problems for people. So I have to adjust dosages of nutrition for people. Sure. Yeah. Um, so goodbyelupus.com, you can click work with me and mm-hmm. I have private appointments. So goodbyelupus.com, you really have all the resources between the classes and appointments and other things for people and yep, for free daily support, all my social media is the way to go. Wonderful. Well, I highly encourage people to go out there and find those videos. It's She actually has one video that's about four hours long because it's got all three courses kind of all connected together, but it is a load of information. You will be so encouraged to just know that reversing whatever you're dealing with on an autoimmune disease situation is possible. And you'll see lots of success stories there as well. So I'll encourage people to do that. Dr. Goldner, I'm so grateful for your time and just so honored to have you on the program. Thank you for taking time out to be with us. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much. I hope that it's helping others who are listening. I'm sure it will. Thanks again. There are 11 high impact takeaways here. I'll summarize them now. Number one, life is short and potentially very short. There is more to autoimmune disease than just your genetics. Nutrition plays a huge role, and the good news is you have control of how you nourish yourself. Number two, chronic disease is something that's man-made, and we can undo it, but we have to be committed, and we need to nourish ourselves properly, work on the things that our souls need, like sleep, working through stress, forgiveness, 
and shifting our mindset so we are able to heal. Number three, we can't always choose how our bodies feel, but we can choose what we focus on and what we are obsessing about. So let's get busy obsessing about our future and all the things that we are going to do instead of any fear that maybe we won't make it. Dr. G never believed she would not make it. Number four, our health situation is not a light switch. It's much more like a storm. Lots of contributing factors and indicators that it's on its way. The temperature changes, the winds start to blow, the humidity and all kinds of indicators. Well, it's the same with illness. Nutrition or lack of high stress, trauma, sleep infections, and more all come together to finally create the storm that we would call disease. Number five, Dr. Goldner's positive outlook, her energy and strength is part of her personality and partly how well nourished she is, but it's also part of how she was raised. Giving our children a safe space, a quiet, peaceful home where they never feel threatened, well, that's a gift that will help them every day of their future lives. Number six, if you currently have a diagnosis, a treatment, you've got support and you believe that your doctors are helping you, that's wonderful. Be hopeful and grateful for that. But if they're giving you a dismal prognosis in the process, remember they don't know. So decide, decide if you're going to believe a story, then believe the version where you beat all the odds and you overcome it and keep on living and enjoying a beautiful, full life. Decide what you want out of life and just go after it instead of letting someone else decide what your story is going to be and how your story is going to end. Number seven, speaking of stories, anxiety is a made up story. It's a story of what you think might go wrong. So at the very least, balance that story out with what might go right. At least have balance. Write yourself a letter and redefine what your story is going to be. Number eight, while our brains can go into the future, your five senses are all right here in the here and now. So use your senses to anchor yourself and there you'll find peace and gratitude and even joy. Remember Dr. G's grandmother, she didn't live in her trauma, she lived in the moment. No, you can't control external events, you can't control what might happen, but if you can be in the moment, you can have hope and gratitude and those things will give you a good life. Number nine, Dr. G told us about the importance of shifting our mindset and to stop saying we love food, especially a food that is abusing you or worse yet, trying to kill you. That unhealthy food is just like a drug. We don't love unhealthy food. We're addicted to it and it's creating disease at a truly alarming rate. Once your body changes, your gut and your taste buds change, the cravings you feel right now are completely unavoidable, will go away. When you're addicted, you can't think of a time when you wouldn't want the thing you're addicted to, but once you recover, the item you once were addicted to will actually repulse you. Number 10, in order to find motivation for healing, you need to define your why. Why do you want to heal? So get super clear on the reasons why you want to heal, why you want to beat the cravings and stop the addiction. If your why is big enough, compelling enough, changing your life becomes easier and easier. And number 11, finally, when you hear the music, dance. Just dance, that's it. Be in the moment and dance. Thanks for joining us for this episode. And if you enjoyed the content, please take a moment to share it and consider writing a quick review right here wherever you're listening or watching this episode. Also, Stay tuned for more information about my next round of Fast, Pray, Heal, where we learn about the ancient tool of fasting in its various forms, prepare our homes and our mindsets to take on that adventure. Then we'll conduct a guided fast together as a community, supporting each other to find breakthroughs we never realized were possible. What an adventure. For more information and to sign up for the waiting list, please head over to my website at lisaroars.com. Thank you for listening today. God bless and have a great week.